Welcome to the final episode of Pathos, how to make people feel what you're saying and feel motivated enough by what you're saying to do what you're saying and not the opposite. You know, sometimes speakers have, uh, it can be an arrogance, sometimes speakers have a way of uh, presenting things that make, make people want to do the opposite just to antagonize them or just to get them back like revenge because you made me sit through that. And uh, so we, we uh, I've said it a couple times probably in these lectures uh, that you want to motivate your audience, but you don't want to motivate them to um, <clears throat> shake their fist at you or give you one of these or hit the exits. Uh, you want to motivate them to not just you, you want to inspire them to listen, but you want to inspire them to do as well. And that's what pathos is about, is, if you will, inspiration, inspiring people with what you say. And the way that you do that is to put them in the right frame of mind. Now, the first thing you've got to consider is you have to put them in the right frame of mind to receive your message. But then you want to go beyond that because you want your message to provoke them. Uh, to go and do the thing that you are asking for, and you don't want to do it in a manipulative way. That You don't want to be dishonest with it. You want to be honest. You want them to be honestly motivated because that's the sort of thing that will last. It won't be like, you know, youth camp. I, I mean, who hasn't made a life-changing decision at youth camp? But there are many who make life-changing decisions and their life never changes. So you want it to be something that sticks with them, that they don't go back. Once they've gone, they've crossed a threshold. It's kind of like those uh, gates that you go through where it's a one-way gate. You go in, it, it only spins in one direction. You, go, you walk through that, and there's no return. And it, I mean, not, not every issue is a point of no return. Not every issue is a threshold. But if you're trying, depending on what you're trying to motivate them to do, you want them to be motivated to go and do that thing. So we want to talk about emotional in intensity, emotional intensity and persuasion. Because, again, it's not just a matter of putting them in, them in the right frame of mind to receive your message, depending on what the message is, especially if it's something practical, but also something theoretical. You, I mean, look, when you're preaching the gospel to someone, you want them to believe it, and you want them to believe it in such a way that it changes their life, that, that they never go back into unbelief that uh, once characterized who they were. Uh, it's like a dead man being raised to walk in newness of life. He doesn't, you know, Spurgeon once uh, said that, a man who dies, uh, who, who rises from the dead, doesn't go back to the tomb and spend the night. He doesn't, he doesn't say, you know, it's great being alive, but I'm going to sleep in this tomb. I'm going to make this my home. Uh, he, he leaves that grave and he doesn't go back, which is a good analogy of the Christian life as well, that we don't want to go back to the grave. We don't want to go back to the old way. When Israel left Egypt, they... they wanted to go back a few times, but they shouldn't have gone back, and they shouldn't have wanted to go back either. So, so when we talk about putting the audience in the right frame of mind, there also needs to be the appropriate intensity, and you need to stir that appropriate int intensity. Again, not manipulating, not, uh, not stirring up or provoking, way overdone and overwrought. And there's, there are a lot of ways that we sometimes are overwrought with things that are not a big issue there. So Sharon Crowley, in her book, <clears throat> Ancient Rhetorics for Contemporary Students, said that emulate, I'm sorry, she said that emotional intensity alters in accordance with the spatial and temporal proximity of the people or situations that arouse them. Okay, so spatial uh, proximity, that, those are big words. Spatial proximity means how close are you to the people involved in the issue, or how close are you to the issue itself? How personal is this to you? Uh, 
we feel more passionate about something that we are invested in or something that relates to us directly. And if an issue doesn't relate to us or doesn't seem to relate to us directly, then we're not as likely to be um, stirred up by it. Now, uh, speaking of preaching the gospel, many people today are indifferent about God and religion and spiritual things and so on. And that indifference makes it very difficult for us to reach those people. So, and, and it's because they don't think that it really relates to them in their life. They don't see themselves as sinners. They are things they may be ashamed of. Uh, but, they, you know, that shame, actually in our world today, uh, young people are being taught that shame is it's something to be avoided, that, uh, that that feeling of shame is like a holdover, a carryover from um, when we left the caves as cavemen and embraced religion as necessary as a cultural vehicle to um, evolve us to where we are today. So uh, many just look at shame as like weakness of character that they need to shed, uh, kind of like weakness of body is shed at the gym, and we shed shame as well. So you're trying to help them, and, and in some cases you have to help the audience to see why this issue matters to them. Uh, and so the more successful you are at making them feel that, the more likely it is that you can move them to action. We feel more strongly about an injustice committed by a family member than we do an injustice committed by a friend. And you notice that sometimes that people will make excuses or even justify uh, what someone close to them does that's wrong, clearly wrong, and that they're laying aside principles that they hold dear in order to do that. So uh, it's just human nature for us to do that. We might even feel indifferent about an injustice committed by a perfect stranger against a perfect stranger. And you know this to be true because you can listen to the radio or you can you know, turn on the news and you can read or hear about some crime injustice that was committed. You might, depending on the presentation of it, you might, uh, you might be outraged by it, but um, frankly, it happens so much and we hear about it so much that we become kind of indifferent to it. So uh, some of that is related to just our familiarity with this, and some of it is related to the fact that we don't know these people at all. Here's another interesting point. If my friend dents my car, I'm much more forgiving than if my enemy or my adversary dents my car. Then I want my pound of flesh, and I want it now. And I'll take the blood too, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> but on the other hand, if my friend mocks me for something that's very important to me, or slights me and disregards me when he's with other friends that he values more than me, or treats me with insolence in front of other people, I feel that and the outrage of that much more intensely than if an enemy did it. If an enemy did it, well, I expect that. I'm antagonistic to him too. So th this thing of proximity can be, uh, it introduces some interesting dynamics. Now, a similar thing, not the same thing, but a similar thing, we believe that we ought to be treated with dignity by those who are above us or outrank us. We think they should treat us with respect, and that's a part of justice. And young people in particular have a sense of justice. That's why uh, you, if you're a teacher in school, it's very, you've got to be care very careful about speaking sarcastically or disrespectfully to your students because they will feel that that's an injustice and that you should be above that as well. We put up with more from those who are beneath us. As, you know, as a pastor, I know that the way sometimes people talk to me, if I talk to them that way, they would leave the church and never come back. Once in a great while, you hear of a pastor who leaves his church and never comes back and becomes very bitter because of the way he was treated by the people in the church. It's, 
It's funny, but when you, when you become a pastor, you kind of expect that people are going to mistreat you or treat you badly. That kind of goes with the territory. Some of it is, again, our innate rebellion against authority because in our minds, authority is representative of God and those who are in rebellion against God, or I should say, any area of rebellion against God will show up uh, in the relationship to authority. I know that uh, for four years I was the assistant pastor here, and everyone loved me. Then I became the pastor, and for a while it felt like everyone hated me. And uh, that's just, again, that's what we sign up for when we go into the ministry. On the other hand, Aristotle said that people think they're entitled to be treated with respect by those inferior in birth, in power, in virtue, and generally in whatever they themselves have much of. So you'll find this to be true. If a person has a lot of money and you don't, uh, they will sneer at you and expect, though, that and take it as a great offense if you sneer at them or mock them in any way. Those who with much education also. Um, I was, now I've talked before about the uh, physics professor at Weber State that I've encountered, that I, that I met when I was out canvassing, and just the scorn that he had for me, his, it, it, because I don't have you know, letters, alphabets, uh, alphabet soup after my name, like PhD or THD or any of that kind of thing, and just uh, treated me like an ignoramus. And uh, But also, it was interesting when I answered him back, there was almost a bristling, like, how dare you have a question that I can't answer? So this is, again, the complex way that emotional intensity works. So you're teased, you're okay with being teased by someone older than you when often you wouldn't put up with it from someone younger, depending on how much younger. If they're a year younger, maybe not. But if they're five years younger, like a high school kid is giving you a hard time, uh, you might take it in a good natured way and you might look at it as disrespect as well. Uh, so, <clears throat> and that's especially true if it's your younger brother. Emotional intensity is also felt more so when it's shared by others around you. That's why mobs, you know, they say mob rule. A mob is the most easy, the simplest thing to manipulate. If you can get the mob all feeling a certain way, people will go along with it even if they don't know what in the world we're angry at. They'll just be angry like everybody else. This is, again, the way that we are, Quite often, emotions and relationships uh, kind of merge together and have this great mixing. Also, the more recent the situation, the more intensely we feel about it. Um, as time goes by, and even with an outrage, as time goes by, uh, the intensity that we initially felt is blunted just by the passing of time. We know this to be true. We've all gotten very angry, maybe even lost our temper about something. Uh, and then as either we <clears throat> blew our top and had this big blow up, or as time passed, uh, things calmed down for us. So uh, I, I'd use as an example 9-11. 9-11 is uh, still fresh, it seems, in my mind. But I, with each passing year, I feel less intensely about it. Many that are watching this video, your college students, you were not even born in 2001 when 9-11 happened. So you've read about it, you've heard about it, you've had your parents explain it to you, but for you, it's like Pearl Harbor, it's history. And so you, you may feel the outrage of it, but you don't feel it the way those who experienced it feel about it. So that's emotional intensity. Now, the most important thing for you as an orator to know is your audience's mindset, your audience's emotion about a particular issue. You want to know, are they with you? Are they with your case? Are they against you? Do they care even? And so we can divide the attitudes of our audience into one of these three categories. There is a hostile audience, um, there is an indifferent audience, and there is an accepting or friendly audience. Now, 
thinking about that, which one do you think is the most difficult to persuade? Definitely, you're not going to say that the friendly case, your supporters are not the most difficult to persuade. They want to be persuaded. They're already persuaded. They just want you to move them to action. And so for them, really, persuasion amounts to a pep rally. It's just, you know, like right before we go, like a Donald Trump rally kind of thing. You know, the people going to those are his supporters. He is just stirring them up. And that's why his speeches work the way that they do. <clears throat> so you might be thinking the most difficult audience to persuade is the indifferent. Because you have to, uh, you have to motivate them to care before you can motivate them to do. And if you're thinking that, you are correct. The apathetic have to be persuaded to care. You, you're getting nowhere with them. So the hostile audience at least has the virtue of caring about the issue. They care about it deeply. And if you can flip them from being hostile to being friendly, you'll have an ally for life. They'll love you till the day you die. You'll be their, you'll be their, uh, their cult leader. They'll be your groupies forever. The indifferent, you have to get them to care about it. So <clears throat> two things then affect a person's willingness to change their mind. And, and that's what you've got to get to. And by the way, you're in training for ministry. Probably if you're watching this, you're in training for ministry. So, so you are all about getting people who are unwilling to become willing uh, on certain things. That's, that's what ministry is about. So what makes people willing to change their mind? Uh, well, one thing is the emotional intensity of their opinions. So how strongly do they hold that opinion? How passionate are they about this issue? Uh, when you encounter someone uh, who immediately wants to go to a bunch of, you know, and has a bunch of things to say in opposition to what you are saying, you know you've got someone who studied it, is passionate about it, believes in it firmly. So that is a clue to you what you have to overcome. <clears throat> also, how much is their identity wrapped up in the opinion? So there are certain things that cause you to identify more with a certain opinion. You're, many who are watching this video are Bible college students. You're paying money to go to Bible college. You're giving up years of your life for this training. That's, you're taking on an identity right there that makes, it, makes you far more unwilling to change your mind on certain things. <clears throat> the same thing, you know, uh, here in Utah, our Mormon neighbors uh, do something that's genius. Their young men, when they finish high school, go on a two-year mission. And for two years, they defend the faith. Having lived here for the 25 years now, I can tell you that many of them, when they graduate from high school, they have no idea what they believe. They don't know what they believe until they go on their mission, and immediately they are defending it, and as a result, they are studying it a lot. But if you defend something every day for two years, your identity becomes very wrapped up in that thing. It becomes very difficult for you to change your mind later on. Similarly, if you write a book, uh, if you get into debates with people, if you lose friends over an issue, your identity is becoming more and more wrapped up in that issue. Okay, uh, we've got one more thing to deal with. I'm going to pause this and then we'll come back to it. <clears throat> 